Our next presenter is Ratko from Projectura. Yeah, yeah. Did okay. I get the name? Yeah, it's a hard right. one, I know, but still, I okay. can repeat it. I did it, apparently. All right, sorry about that. And, uh, well, we're going to be talking about big and open data for social good. Yeah. What a program. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, um, I know we are pretty much close to lunch, so I think this, is, this one is light enough, uh, but still important. And uh, I apologize at the beginning, I, I'm not part of your world, right? I'm not a research marketing professional. I'm mostly working with the governments and NGOs and some of the international organizations that you will basically recognize from the slides that I have. But uh, I want to thank the organizers to think uh, that, I mean, they thought that it would be great to have a topic which basically connects and extends a little bit uh, the thing that you think it's really important, and I saw from that from the trends, which is big data, and uh, talk a little about about the uh, open data. I think you're all familiar with this one, and how we use open data basically in this specific part of, of the activities that we do, which is uh, social or, or impact, uh, social impact uh, activities. So, um, Okay, it worked. So most of the questions that we got from the people outside and from, from the governments uh, is that there's a lot of discussion about big data and, and open data. So is there any value in it? So if we, if we die and use that data, if we publish the data in the governments and so forth, you know, what would be the value that we can get out of, out of that data? You're coming from the, I would say, countries which already did some, some, uh, some projects or portals about opening up the data. But pe people are constantly questioning themselves, you know, what would be the value if we create something around this one? So one of the projects that we did was related to the value of economic value of open data. What if we publish all the data that we have currently somewhere in the silos of the governmental and other organizations? And actually, the results was, result was astonishing. Only in European Union, we would basically come up to the 200 billion Euro, euros in the year of 2020 of additionally generated value if we just like open the data. We don't think how it's going to be used. We just enable all the data that we have uh, to the outside world. When I say all data, there are two exceptions, right? The first one is private data. And I would say from the pre some of the presentations I, I, I was looking at, you're looking at that data, but that when I say private, I mean not non-identifiable data. So you, it cannot relate to you personally. And the second one is classified data, right? Which b belongs to the military or whatever. Most of the data that government have, uh, for, for example, in UK, they estimated that 80% of the data is basically in, is in that bucket, should and could and will be freely available through the open data mechanisms. When I say it free, not all data, of course, is free, even if it will be published. Because some of the government organizations think they need to spend some time and therefore money to prepare some of the data that you, that you can access. But it's a big numbers, right? And in the terms of the added value to the GDP, this is maybe, I don't know, not that significant to some bigger countries, but when you look at the smaller ones, you know, which, which are looking into the ways how they can grow uh, really quickly, right? Uh, this is something that they are really, really looking at. So what is the big data? You know that. It's a huge shift from the, I would say, things that we used to look at, right? Like what, what is generated in the computer systems, like logs and emails. There's a lot of data which is currently coming through the social media in the, in the forms of video. Video is, grow, video is growing fantastically big. But we also expect there will be huge and significant number which is coming from the Internet of Things, from the smaller devices that you carry in your pockets or which will be installed around the cities and around, around the countries, right? So this is, of course, is going to grow. Uh, currently, when people look at the big data, they're thinking about, you know, what can we do with that data? You know, sorry, what, what should be the things that we can um, implement based on the, on the big data? So they're looking at the, also at the new business models. Big data today is very connected with the businesses and generating new business models. So one of the examples is, of course, uh, Uber. I think at least some of you use the service, right? It just started from the thinking, what type of resources we have, like cars, which are sitting somewhere in the parking lot or in the garage, which we don't use, right? We paid huge amount of money out of it, uh, for it, and basically we are not using. So they did the research, research, a lot of data, 
was there, and they found out that 96% of the time, basically, your car that you paid 30, 50,000 euros for is actually sitting idle somewhere in the parking lot or in the, in the garage. So if I didn't mention your car, and I have kind of tricks you, trick you to spend 50k euros for something which you will not use 96% of your time, there will be a lot of questions about this one. Why? Same goes for the things that you have in your closets or somewhere stored in, 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 in rooms, like when you need uh, a hole in your wall for a new picture, right? A lot of people go to the supermarket or whatever and they buy a drill, drilling machine, right? Which really doesn't, is not used for a number of years later, but we, we are trying to solve the problems in, in, in those ways. So big data today is really connected to uh, data-driven decision-making. There's, there's a lot of, and, and you saw that in previous presentations, a lot of uh, efforts into having to have an insight in, in the big data or data that, that you are trying to, trying to collect and use. Open data is a little bit different. Open data came from the, I would say, this soft notion of, you know, can we have more data, which is coming from the usually closed silos, uh, which belongs to, this, to the governments or cor corporations or science world, so that we actually open that data sometimes in raw form, sometimes prepared, but that it's also freely available through the different mechanisms to all of you. Right? And one of the ideas that when we discussed about this conference was, okay, where we can and how we can find that data, and should it be only or, or used for the things which have social impact or, or uh, um, impact that matters to you as, as a people, not as a consumers or, or, or as a customers? And could we, in a way, combine those two to, to get, a, get a, a, be, a better results, right? So, you know, we started with, with this, I would say, thinking about how we can control diseases, how we can predict uh, earthquakes, how we can generate more jobs. And this is, this is exactly how the most of the governments and organizations are thinking today about the open data. But also, when you use, uh, when you're trying to do a research or you want to kind of uh, solve some problem, there's a lot of data which is sitting somewhere which could be very helpful for your demographics or data about the schools. Um, one of the best examples that, that uh, I saw is a website called Zillow.com. It's actually real, real estate. And when you're buying flat, right, a lot of people are com combining and looking at the prices per square meter and so forth. But if you can map a lot of other data to it, and you know in some of the countries that's, uh, that's available, right, what is, where are the schools and what is the average grade on mathematics in that schools and how many kids from that specific schools went, went to which universities and, you know, what was their success. That dramatically impacts you in, in your decision, you know, where you are going to buy a flight and, and, you know, what price you are willing to pay, right? And all that data is sitting somewhere currently in most of the countries, we're still struggling to find a way how we can publish, in, publish and open the data, right? And also with the open data, in contrast to big data, we are trying to find this 1% impact. So big data, a lot of data is going there. There's uh, not too many people and companies have the ability to consume and find the patterns in big data so that it can be impactful. In open data, we are looking at really small sets, small sets of data that have our strongest impact on whatever we want to do. Um, 1% also correlates with the resources that I was telling you about. Like, you know, if you have a car and you are not using it, you know, it's just a resource that you not use. And there's a great book, you have it on the slide, which basically debates that the next revolution that we are going to witness is going to be the revolution how we use our resources. Data is one of the resources that we don't use in a proper way, right? So, um, not only you know, how we use water or how we use air or how we pollute or don't. It's, it's about the stuff that we have and we actually don't use in the proper way. So we are targeting this 1%. So some of the projects, some of them I was part also, of them was related to this 1%. One of really important currently 1% is polio virus. And I think you all know about this one, right? So polio is a basic disease which, uh, which attack kids with the very, very unfortunately, very bad consequences. And we are trying for the last 20 years to eradicate 
the polio virus from the face of the Earth. So, you know, from the big data, which is around a quarter of a million kids 20 years ago had polio around the world, currently we came to a, a, around 500 kids around the world, right? So this is a huge effort, which is, based, which is based only on really strict and really targeted impact, I would say, which, are, which are countries and some foundations are trying to do. And believe me, it was way much more easier to come from half a million to 500 than to go from 500 to zero. Right? So some of the countries or regions like Southeastern Asia last year, they declared they're like polio free, but we'll still have Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nigeria, where, it's, where basically people are chasing virus, right? And we are trying to combine this big data and scale it down into really quick open data in the terms of where we need to hit something so that it happens. Every single decision in the last 10, every single decision in the last 10 years that we, that we did basically with this one was strictly based on evidence on the data. Not a single dollar, I would say, was not spent if there was no evidence what is going to happen if you spend something like this. On the contrary to this one, right, and maybe the picture is not right, but you'll get the message. Uh, recently, they did a study in uh, US Obama administration about how they spend money, right, the budget. And they found out that only 1% of those decisions is based on evidence, right? So 99% of money is basically, you know, it goes with the flow, you know. People have different opinions on what should be done. But evidence is missing in 90-90% of the, of the cases. Can you imagine if instead of 1%, we managed to spend 2% based on evidence? And this is UK number of their budget a few years ago, but you know how big US budget or our worldwide budget on how we spend money uh, actually is. So think about this one the same way you, the way you're looking at the Uber or the way you look at the drilling machine or whatever. We just have a lot of resources which we are not spending in the proper way because the data is not connected to it. Unfortunately, most of the time that data is not available, right? And this is why a lot of countries are working on this one. Um, this maybe looks strange, you know, but when you look at the polio, this is the thing which sometimes, unfortunately, we think that happens somewhere else, right? Uh, our kids are vaccinated, right? So we are on the, on the safe side. Uh, but in some of the countries, this is still still a problem, right? Uh, but we have a problem which could hit you in an in a, in a even bigger way, like Ebola virus, right? Which is like, this is not something which happens somewhere else. And if it comes to our countries, we are very, very efficient in keeping it safe, in keeping, keeping it in, in, in closed, closed circles. But in, in Africa or some other countries, there's, there's not, not a, almost not a single mechanism that we can use here to control something like this. So what from the, you know, from the perspective of 1%, what would, what would be the best way to spend money so that you control it and you, you basically uh, stop it from, from spreading around. You know, where to invest? What would be the data, what evidence we need to, to invest in the proper way? And it doesn't have to be such a huge case. One of the projects that we are working on is currently is in my home country, which is Croatia. 51% of young people are un unemployed. It's a third, third in EU, EU, I think, Greece and Spain have a even bigger uh, percentage of young people. So where do you spend your 1%, right? Do you, do you just spread everything around the unemployed people and hope for the best? Where do you find a pattern in the big data which will show you that if you do this, you know, basically this will be the best outcome which will generate the best uh, value out of that investment, right? And you need some ev evidence which supports something like this and this is based, you know, this, this is based on, on open data. So actually, you know, it doesn't have to be global and worldwide problem. It could be really local or national that you are trying to mix with, with all that data. So, you know, having the access to the data, especially open data, is really critical to something like this. So where is the data, right? So if you, as a professionals, after this session, you think like, well, okay, you know, uh, let's, let's go and find, you know, where's the, this open data? There's a bunch of probably data that I, I can use. Actually, there are three great sources. Apart from the fact that you can go to the internet and just key in open data and there will be a lot of links. So the first one is government data, of course, and the, the 
best examples, and you are probably the citizens of those countries, like UK, US, uh, France, um, you know, Spain is doing also a great job. Uh, you can find it on the portals. But there's also an international organization called OGP, Open Government Partnership, which talks a lot about transparency, openness, collaboration. And I saw that on, on one of the slides also, that this idea of how the research is going to, to move forward. Right, so OGP is around, I think, around 80 countries today. And they all commit in what they want to do in the next period, like in the terms of opening, opening, uh, opening the government. And believe me, when you talk to them, uh, um, really quickly you move from the open government into the open data. They, they say, okay, if we publish the data outside, if it's freely available, then we are radically more transparent, we are open. You remember the case from UK and, uh, and the uh, MPs about how they spend or when they spend money, right? And this small amount of data, which is probably less than 1%, which is available, did a significant change and significant impact on the way how MPs behave and, you know, what they are and how they spend uh, the taxpayers' money and how they report uh, what they did with this one. So there's a, that, that, that's a significant change. So OGPs or any organization around this one. There's a lot of big data which is behind this one, right? So if you are thinking about looking at the, any data which, which came from the experiments like large hydrogen, uh, which was uh, basically chasing, uh, chasing the God's particle, right? You can basically download that data. It's in a zillion of terabytes, in petabytes. I don't know what you will do with it. But there is a, there is a project which basically from this huge amount of big data is trying to look at the best patterns and basically publish that as an open data. And you had the good example, if you remember, a few months ago, unfortunately, uh, Malaysian airlines crashed into the sea and they were searching for the remains of the uh, aircraft. And, and actually, the, it's a, such a huge space that even with all the technology that we had, satellites or whatever, we couldn't figure it out, you know, what happened, right? And then it, they shifted. They basically decided on 1% of all the data or all the space that they have. Uh, and they said, okay, let's publish this publicly. And people will help us. They will look at the pictures and they will try to help us, you know, what is on the picture itself? Is it like remaining of the plane or it's something else or whatever? So they open up the data and they basically crowdsource the search for the, for the plane. I think still not, unfortunately unsuccessful. And the last one really interesting for you, I would say, is open corporate. So I know that you're collecting and using a lot of data about the corporations. So you know, uh, um, in the terms of uh, uh, for the research and, and, and investigation and uh, trying to do an insight about them. So this came basically out of the really interesting comment that David Cameron did on one of the meetings. He said, PM uh, UK, he said, look, I'm fully committed that we will open every single data set that we have in our government. No questions about this one. But what about corporations, right? What about stuff which is flowing around, where the money goes. Why can't we follow the money? Swiss bank now is a really good example of, of something like this. So there will be more and more pressure on the corporations, private institutions, to publish any type of data that they have, which is of course not kind of trademarks, secrets, or whatever they have, but they will push more and more data sets into the, into the public so that you can use it. So, you know, we will work more on the ways how we open and how we enable you to collect and, and, and find that data and how you can use it. There will be way much more data available, which is freely, freely available, anyone can access, which will help you, but it will also challenge your business. Because if you currently are the one which is between the data and the customer, or the data and people in general, right? Like, like all these examples that I, that I show you, right? That means that we are switching from the, this, we are professionals, like vertical um, thinking to general, generalistic horizontal thinking with every, where everyone can use the data and can have some, some of the outcomes out of it. So in the future, I think, we will all be data scientists in a way not just because you have the Excel sheet on your computer, right? just because the data will be freely in raw form or any other form available to all of us. And we, I think in a way, we could achieve way much more better results if we 
not think only about you know what type of economic value we can do it, which, which is fine, right? But also what type of global, social, whatever type of impact we can do because we are bridging bridging those two those two worlds. So with that, I want to thank you.